Alice Cooper was the ultimate marketer. When I was 10, this is back in the 70s, you can probably do the math now. When I was 10, I said, Alice Cooper, is that like a guy or a girl? I said, we're not sure. Imagine that, a transvestite back in the 70s, or a cross-dresser, or someone who did really weird things. It was pretty bold back then. He was the ultimate marketer. The, the, um, his concerts would sell because people had all these rumors about him. He, he, he'd have, uh, he would kill people on stage, and he had blood, and he had dolls, and, and he was shooting himself with these big needles. And this was the time of the LSD and the trips, and you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and peace, and love. It was a great time. But he was an excellent marketer. And um, the reason he was a good marketer is because he mastered the word shtick. What does a shtick mean? Anybody want to help me with this one? What's your shtick? Strong point. Close. Yes. It's what you're renowned for. Right? Uh, Jim Carrey, famous Canadian actor, is renowned because he's a funny guy. He wears a tutu, pretending he's a football player, and he's Ventura. Right? He's also the cable guy. That's a shtick. Lady Gaga's shtick is that she is a weird, cool, hip, pop music artist. Michael Jackson's shtick is that he would sing with a high-pitched voice and do the moonwalk. That was the shtick back then, and, and, and Alice Cooper's shtick was exactly what you saw earlier. But marketing was a lot simple back in the 70s, right? It's a lot more complex today. You've got social media, you've got to know everything, there's too many things to learn, but it was so simple back then. I mean, things like the four Ps. Talk about a little bit of marketing. What I want to do tonight is talk to you about a little bit of marketing. I want to give you a sample of what a master school of management is. These master classes are a good way to sort of kick the tires and say, okay, who's a professor? I want to go listen to them. Do I like him or not? Do I like the content? So the idea tonight is to give you a bit of a sample as to the courses we go through, half time because I've only got about 40 minutes. But I'm going to go slow on some stuff. You'll say, well, I don't need an MBA to know what the four Ps are. But at one point, we'll go pretty fast because you're supposed to follow me. And the books that we usually use are, are quite, quite extensive. So anyway, marketing in the 70s was simple. The four Ps, I mean, if you wanted to buy a record, where would you go? A record store, right? That's pretty simple. The product, one of the four Ps, was either an LP, right? This is the long playing 33 RPMs, or the record, the 45s. The prices haven't really changed, right? Look at the 99 cents. Back then, you could buy a 45, which meant you had songs on both sides. You the 49 cents or the 99 cents. So the prices really haven't changed that much. The promotions, that was cool back then, right? If you wanted to, to buy records, you'd be part of a record club. And if you buy, if you subscribe to a 12-month program where you buy a record every month, you get four records for 99 cents. Now, what's, how is that a promotion? Is that exciting or what? Yeah. That, was, that was not leading edge, that was bleeding edge back then. Right? Loyalty. Oh my God, the girls would throw their underwear at Alice Cooper, right? The guys, I don't know what they would do, but they would go to concerts. Loyalty was insane. People would line up for, for days to buy tickets. Loyalty was in vogue back then. It was fun. You can tell this lady here is either having pain or she's just beside herself. Marketing communications. Oh my God, you had an AM channel on, on your radio. And if you're lucky, his records would play on, on, the, on the radio. You had a choice of maybe three AM channels per city. I mean, it was very simple back then. So why did I choose Alice Cooper? Well, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he's the guy on the right, by the way. Okay. I had the pleasure, I, at, at times I do meet celebrities, which is fun at times, which is not so much fun. This was a fun moment. Uh, at the Rome Telecom, we, 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 we sponsored Best Fest. And I got to meet Pink, and that was okay. And Marlon Manson was sort of like, what happened there? <laughs> this guy was cool. We walk in this room, and he's hosting us. He says, hey, come on in, welcome to media. Oh, and the girls look good here. If I, if I kiss the girls, do I need garlic or something, he was making the jokes about uh, Transylvania, and he plays golf, he's a cool guy, he's written a few books on golf, but the guy is clearly successful, he's in his 60s, 
which shows that sex, drugs, and rock and roll is probably not that bad for you. <laughs> he, uh, he looks a little weather-beaten, but he was, he was a cool guy. He really was a cool guy. And that's, I didn't choose Alice Cooper for that reason, but it was one of my career highlights. I chose music because it's a fun way to start. If I started my presentation on the different types of paints, oil and water, you'd go, what is this? Or if I said, there's, you know, I'm a carpet salesman, you've got, you've got shag, you've got commercial carpet, that's exciting. You'd go, oh my god, this is going to be brutal. Why did I come here? I chose music because it's a common denominator, right? You all have your own choices of music. You may like Alice Cooper, or you may not. You may like Manelli. <laughs> or you may not. <laughs> Sorry? You might like it or not. But anyway, the music is a common denominator. And what I wanted to do is, some of you know me, some of you don't. I don't know all of you, but I wanted to reach out as a communicator. Because as marketers, that's what we do. Right? We communicate. So when you want to communicate to an audience of people that you don't know, you find a common denominator. In this case, it's music. We all love some form of music. Now, Someone very wise told me that music is an international language. So if you're Thai or Brazilian or Chinese or Peruvian or, or Romanian or Czech, when you're playing music, you're playing from a, a single scripture, right? The, the music is all the same. It doesn't matter what language you speak. So this lady who told me that music is an international language, language this wonderful lady, and her name is, is Mom. She's my mother. <laughs> And you know why she knows this? Because she had a beautiful voice. She used to sing. I unfortunately did not earn my living by singing. Uh, otherwise, I'd probably be poor. <laughs> but I am poor. So anyway, I didn't sing. I didn't have the, the, the genetics. But she told me that music is an international language. And, and because she sang with very popular people, can anybody tell me who this is? I'm so young and you're so old. This Diana, I am old. Please stay with me. Oh, yeah. Exactly. I told you I wouldn't take it to sing But do you recognize him? Yes, yes, yes. It's Paul Anka, right? Paul Anka at 16. This is Paul Anka today. He sang the song Diana. It's, it's a classic back in the 60s. And my mother told me he was not a very nice person. He was very nasty. He'd come in and say, I want the music like this. I don't want you here. I don't like what you're doing. And over there, the music stinks. I want it fixed because I'm only here for five minutes and I'm out of here. He was nasty. <laughs> but he did very well. And fast forward over here, uh, one of my friends, Puyu, is an organizer of, of events. And last year, Anka came to Romania. I said, Puyu, you met Paul Anka. What was that like? He says, I said, was he nice? He says, no. <laughs> he actually used a term. It started with A and it finished with E. I don't want to use here, but he says the guy was nasty. Uh, but it's it's what he is. He's, he's he's huge. But music really is one way of communicating to people, and, and and it's a common denominator. And that's why I chose music. Now, when was, when was the last time you used your mother in a board presentation? <laughs> Huh? Has anybody used a picture of your mother? We should try it maybe one day. Maybe not a good career move, but I can do that now. Because this is not my career. I can show whatever I want. But we're going to talk about my mother later. Okay? We have a tendency of making things so complicated. And what I want to do today for the next... I didn't put my timer, but I did tell that I could pull me off the stage later. Uh, we do complicate things, and what, I want, what I'm going to talk to you about today is not extremely complex. But as marketers, we make things complex, and we forget about the basics. And as a, by the way, who, who's a marketer here? Okay. Who's in sales? Who's done both? <laughs> oh, okay, but we're not all marketers. That's interesting. That's, and we've got a few salespeople. Good, we're going to have a, fun, a little bit of fun with that later. We, what I want to do is, is go back to the basics, but sometimes things seem so simple that we overcomplicate things. And I want, to, I want to raise those points with you. We're going to do it by raising what I call our five landmines. What's a landmine? You're walking down the street, all of a sudden, boom, you're blowing. Well, that's what would happen if you're in Kabul. That's not going to happen in Eucharist. 
Although you could f fall in a hole <laughs> and hurt yourself, but you're not going to shoot, you're not going to, you know, injure yourself at that point. But a, a landmine is a, is, a, is a basic thing that you forget as a marketer, and if you forget those things, it really can affect your career. So I found five things, or five landmines, that I want to go over with you, and that's my structure. This is the first one. Sales and marketing. What's the difference? Who's more important, sales or marketing? <laughs> <laughs> sales is one of the four P's, by the way. Sales people hate to be told. Sales and marketing really is one of the four P's. Okay. But is marketing more important than sales? No, they have to come together. You really can't ask the question. I mean, it, it's like saying what's important. Who was first, the chicken or the egg? There is really no difference. Both are, are vital to an organization. The problem we have is a lot of marketers really haven't sold things before. Now, if you're a marketer or you're thinking about becoming a marketer, it's not the end of the world. I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anybody that you should never sold something. But if you haven't, you need to feel the pain of selling. Selling is not easy. Trust me, I've sold helping services, I've sold lemonade as a kid. I've sold mobile phones, I've sold events, I've sold my services. Uh, it's not easy. And uh, but once you sell, you're on top of the world. So marketers that haven't done sales, you should really look into this. And I'll give you a little bit of advice. Robert Cialdini wrote a book, he came to Romania last year, he wrote a book called Influence. He's a psychologist. He wanted to know why people were able to influence other people. And how he did that, he's, he enrolled to all these free sales courses that Amway and Avon and, and uh, Tupperware. And what's that pill company that uh, in Romania here, they sell pills? Or, um, um, herbal. Now you're going to go, oh, I don't want to do that. But you know, when you've bought all your stuff, that's a tactic, right? It's a, it's a marketing tactic. If they approach Carmen and say, Carmen, I want you to sell Herbal Life. They'll say, yes, I'm well. So they'll say, well, you need to buy like $500 worth of stuff. They'll say, well, who do I sell? We'll talk about that later. So Carmen <laughs> buys all this stuff. It's in her basement. And now she's going, well, how do I sell this stuff? So they'll give you ways to, to sell free training, either one-on-one, -on -one, mentoring, videos, that kind of thing. And Cialdini said it was cool because he got to learn uh, that after you have after you've tried to sell this stuff, you probably have no friends left. <laughs> <laughs> and if your family don't want to talk to you, you've got still a whole bunch of stuff in your, your basement that you haven't sold. <laughs> but I'm not knocking it. By the way, I mean, I've done multi-level marketing. I was selling water filters. And after a while, I noticed that this is not going to be easy. If you're going to be doing marketing, do yourself a favor. Don't tell your employer. You don't have to tell your employer. You just, just do this on the side. But get to know the pain of sales. Sales requires discipline. It's a consistent day-to-day -day effort. You're coming in, you're making phone calls, you make appointments, you visit the customers, you try and close. And account managers, we'll call them account managers, people, salespeople, uh, they, they're very effective if they do the same thing over and over again. And this is what they need to do on a day-to-day. Right? You're making appointments, you're calling, after you're calling to make an appointment. If you try and sell on the phone, it's a waste of time. You want to try and get in the door. Once you're in the door, you sort of do a little something <coughs> and then and try to impress the customer. And then after that, you move on, to, you, you follow up to that. You come back, you have lunch, you make more phone calls. You do this all day, every day. So don't assume that salespeople are always having coffee, which is what marketing people think, right? It's a lot tougher than that. And my experience is that as an account manager, you need to do this for about a year and a half because before you get effective. You can sell. But in order to be fully effective, know your customers, you learn the tricks of the trades, you avoid the mistakes because you will make mistakes. You focus on customer needs. I mean, I could, I could, sp I could spend a whole day on this. And Sandy Vatsi, which is one of our other professors, is an excellent teacher, teacher and professor in sales. I strongly recommend next master class, if he comes here, you've got to come. The guy's amazing. <coughs> the, fact that, the fact that he's part Canadian helps. <laughs> I like that about him. And uh, expert closing, because really, representing the product is easy, but closing is where it matters. So, wh what's the big deal with sales? Well, if you're a marketer, you usually get your information about the market in a variety of ways, right? Primary data, secondary data, uh, 
websites, reports, peer groups, uh, research, and sales. The typical dialogue between the marketing and the sales guys, the marketing will say, well, what did the customer say? The price is too high. <laughs> okay, but what else do you say? The price is too high. <laughs> now, I got that the second time, but what did the customer The price is too high. Okay, I get it. This is going nowhere. But if you're, if you're a smart marketer, you'll say, uh, that customer, can you bring me over to visit him next week? Sales people say, sure. So when you sit down with the client, the client says, well, the price is a little high, but you know, I really want you to fix this. Fix this about your product, or you know what? I was a little upset by the way I was treated by your customer care person. So now, you, as a marketer, you're getting price information, but you're also getting valid input from the client. If you're a marketer, and you're not visiting clients, there is something definitely very wrong. You should be going out and talking to clients, and your salesperson will, uh, will help and facilitate that. Now, if you're not getting feedback from the sales department, there's a few reasons for that. Either you're not welcoming feedback, you don't want the feedback. You're not, you're not, the, the organization is not conducive. I'm amazed. When I was at Ram Telecom, I n almost never had the salespeople knocking my door saying, Paul, you're killing us. In Canada, it was always the case, you know, the salespeople would be harassing marketing, marketing harassing sales, but it's a healthy debate because both are motivated to get the clients. So if you're not having that argument with the market, between the marketer and the sales department, there's a problem. Either you're not, you're not fostering that environment or it's not happening, and that's a mistake. Listen to the music. That's my first summer. Right? You may not like Manelli. You may not like Alice Cooper. You may not hear saying, it's the price. But if you're a marketer, you should listen to the music. Listen to the music here means listen to the salesperson. Engage in the communication with the salesperson. Okay, that's the first landmark. Second one, customer experience. Are we in sync? Are we synchronized? And I'm going to give you a few examples because I love to use examples to, to highlight a few points here. Before I do that, a moment of truth. Does anybody know what a moment of truth is? Can you tell us what a moment of truth is? Uh, zero for second moment of truth. The moment the customer interacts with the product. Very good. Very good. Interacts with the product, interacts with a person, interacts with the company, interacts with the website. A moment of truth is exactly that. It's that unfair or fair moment when you as a customer get the first impression of an organization. And I always remember this because Tom Peters wrote a book called Passion for Excellence. And the example he gave is that when he's talking to an airline executive, and as you sit down as a passenger and you pull down the table, there's a coffee stain on the table. And passengers think, well, if they didn't clean the tray table, did they service the engines? Are we going to make it? Are we going to, are we going to land safely when we get there? Now, it's, 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 it's a bit far-fetched, but it's true, right? The moment of truth is, you can't clean the table. I certainly hope that you're managing uh, the maintenance properly. So a moment of truth, what you want to do is, is maximize the good ones and minimize the bad ones. As you, as the best possible way. So here's my example. A friend of mine receives this SMS. Good PM, yeah, whatever, right? It's the 6th of February. There's, a, there's an amount left on your, on your bank card. And we're going straight to the zero degrees. All right. Total lack of politeness. No warnings. No emails. No like. We'd like to raise to your attention that, or did you know, or out of the blue, no warnings. All right. This bank spends a lot of money on promoting three famous icons. You see these commercials, you want to cry? I want to cry. I'm not a Romanian. They're beautiful commercials because I, I've met some of them and they're just wonderful commercials. And they're, they, they hit the soul, right? They, 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 they grab you. But someone else grabs you by sending you these nasty messages. So what was the result? This friend of mine said, you know what? One car, no, I'm going to cancel all three. This is how you treat me. Because basically, how many people have more than one bank card here? Okay, how many times do you check the balance to see if you've got up that one 50 band to make sure that you cover the monthly fee? Have we got time for that? Mm -hmm. right? So you got multiple cards, and there's probably a chance that the cards are generating this stupid monthly fee, which you don't pay attention. So this is what happened. 
she wasn't paying attention. The card racked up some fees, and they said, you know what? I'm going to uh, reload the credit card. So what's the solution? Don't spend money on Romanian icons if you don't own the messages. You as a marketer, if you're a marketer and if you're not a marketer, tell us to your marketing people tomorrow, you need to own the messages, all the messages. But what is said in between salespeople, customer care, the retention loyalty team, and God forbid what the collections teams are telling you. And I challenge you tomorrow, if you're in marketing, you do an audit on all the messages, the script messages that people say to customers in different scenarios, you'll find at least two shockers. You'll say, oh my God, I can't believe we wrote SMS, we told that to the customer, or we sent them this nasty email. I'm guaranteed you'll find it. So, all customers bring value. You, as a communicator, you as a marketer, you own the message. And they have to be consistent. Consistent. Don't say that your prime brand is this and you love your customer and all of a sudden, hey, you better pay, or we're going to go straight to good food. Right? Got, you've got to be consistent. <laughs> now, I also show, I show my mother in my PowerPoint presentations, and I have this luxury now of having a uh, cartoonist to do cartoons for my presentation. And one is the, one, the lady who introduced me to Bogdan Caruso. Let's imagine we're in the Amazon. And the elephant wants to cross the river. You're saying, Paul, there's no elephants in the Amazon. Okay, but assuming there was, right? And the elephant wants to cross the Amazon, but the Amazon has a lot of piranhas. And piranhas hunt in packs, like TripAdvisor. <laughs> so the poor elephant's saying, I, I, there's a chance there's only one piranha. He crosses the river, comes out of the river, and he's only got one piranha. And the piranha's biting his bum. It's a big piranha. But he's only taking a little bite. Right? These messages, if you don't control these messages, just imagine like the messages is like a river of piranhas. And if you don't manage the messages properly, the, the piranhas will eat your business. Now, this elephant will survive this because it's only one message, one piranha. But if you don't manage the messages, you're going to have a whole bunch of herding elephants here in a skeleton at one point. So that's, I wanted to visually show that to you, that the messages, if it's just one time, it's not a big deal, but if it's multiple times and you're pissing off customers by not controlling the message, you'll end up with a skeleton, not an elephant. Stick to the shape. If you're saying you're the best brand with regards to premium banking service, make sure you check the messages at all touch points. If you're the best brand as a mobile operator, make sure that you're, you're consistent with that. The second message is, stick to the shtick. Oh, apathy. I don't want to talk to you. I haven't had my second coffee. I don't want to talk to customers. I hate customers. I'm bored. I don't want to work here. You annoy me. And you know what? I don't know why. You, you, you. Go away. That's apathy, OK? We're clear on apathy is now, right? Apathy will kill the brain. So, how do we deal with apathy? When a customer complains, he's act, he or she is actually giving you a chance to fix something. You know what's worse than customers complaining? Customers, customers not complaining, and they walk with their feet. They vote with their feet. So, how many times have you actually sat down and written a complaint about something in the last six months? It takes time, right? You're motivated. You you want resolve. You wanna you wanna tell them, you know, I'm I'm upset. And it usually works, but you've taken the time. So very few people will take the time, they'll just walk. So when a customer is giving you a complaint, you need to listen to it. Now, branding is one way of dealing with apathy. I can't deal with branding in, 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 in a few minutes, but I've worked with some very powerful brands where you wanted to kill as an employee working for that organization, you were very proud to show your business card. It was just a fun place to work. Connex was one of those places. Orange, for me, was one of those places. Bell Mobility in Canada was one of those places. Because what I didn't realize back then is the marketing people through the brand values and through the brand experience were making it such that they were consistent. And the brand itself motivated people. 
So the brand really is one way of, the, and the soul of the brand is one way of dealing with this. Because really, what is branding? Branding is a promise delivery. All right? Let me repeat that. A brand is a promise delivery. So if you're, if you're driving a brand new Mercedes, you don't expect it to break down, right? It's, just, it's, just, it's so uncanny to the brand. So if you deliver your promises based on your brand, you're doing okay. Let me give you another example. Yes, I'm going to pick on banking again. Four years ago, my bank says, Mr. Renault, you need to renew your card. No problem. How much time? One week. Okay, one week, no big deal. After I wake, after a week I call and say, so is my card ready? Nope. Okay, how much time? One week. Okay, so I go back and I go to the bank and get money. How many times do you actually go to the bank and get money? No. That's, that's primitive. <laughs> we don't do that anymore, right? But I had to, because I had no card. Stupid foreigner, no card. You know, I've got to go to the bank, get some money. Call back after two weeks, where's my card? Oh, not ready. When will it be ready? One week. <laughs> this goes on for four weeks, right? Six weeks, right, sir. I finally get my card. This is four years ago. Fast forward four years, what, two months, uh, six months ago. My girlfriend gets up. Call from the bank. We were in Dubai. And this is Mrs. So and So. We were in Dubai, and uh, we we're trying to avoid fraud. I'm like that's pretty cool, right? Bank proactively calling you to avoid fraud. That's proactive. That's progressive. They said we'll have to cancel your card. <laughs> <laughs> and, but no problem. You can come in a branch and sign for a new one. And as she's hanging up the phone, I said, "Which bank?" And she says, "The bank." I'm going, "Oh no." <laughs> Took her five weeks to get the card. So the processes had improved by 16%. <laughs> As we're going to Vanessa, there's this beautiful kiosk for the bank. I won't tell you which bank, I want to be fair. But there's this wonderful fellow, nice dress with time. We sit down and saying, five weeks for the card, and, and, and she's telling his story, and he's writing his form, and he goes, hmm. And he goes back and writing his forms. And she said, hey, Paul, Paul had the same problem four years ago. I said, yeah, if we're not upset now, but six weeks for a card. He goes up, he goes, hmm. He goes back to fill in the form. No initiative, like, oh my god, that's terrible. Let me get on the phone now. Let me call someone in customer care. This is insane. You're waiting five weeks for a car. Sit now. No empathy. Now, you're going to tell me, Paul, that's a customer care issue. I'm saying bananas. <laughs> this guy, nicely dressed, very professional, nice tie, didn't want to kill himself for the client. That is where branding comes in. Branding gives you that next urge to want to kill for the customer to want to solve the problem, to do something, to get in a phone booth and undress like Superman. I'm going to fix this problem, <laughs> right? That's what branding does with apathy. Now, this is a picture of an Apple employee. This is what they usually look like. Of course, we don't all work for Apple, right? But we can. We can. As marketers, you need to really get the juice flowing, the soul of the brand, to a point where the employees are engaged to kill for the customer. So again, I can't do that in five minutes, but branding is one way of dealing with apathy. Landmine number four. Of course a campaign is integrated. Right? That's what the ad agencies will tell you. Who does this is what ad agencies do. Ah, of course it's integrated. Wow, right, we're an advertising agency. Come on now. <laughs> Within this landmine, there's sub, there's four pitfalls. Things that you gotta sort of, hey, 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 whoa, whoa, time, I got a question. The first one is is needed that doesn't really uh, reinforce each other. The second one is let's okay, we've got some money, let's spend it, right? No, awareness, we need to do more awareness. <laughs> That's more important than sales, right? and delegate and forget. So let's talk about the first one. I'm going to go a little faster here. But the next time your advertising campaign or manager, your creative director, your client service director says, of course it's integrated. Okay, hold on. How does that TV campaign complement online? Explain it. I, I, I'm not stupid. I, explain this to me. How does, the, uh, how does a customer see the same message in two different medium? One medium and two medium. And explain the link between outdoor and web manager. We're all lazy. You know what customers are lazy? We're all, you're all lazy. I'm lazy. You buy the gas at the same place. You buy your cigarettes at the same place. You buy your food at the same place. You go shopping at the same place. 
We're, as consumers, we're fundamentally lazy. We go to the same place. We're okay with being lazy. It's okay. So if we're lazy, the advertising agency, anybody from an advertising agency here? Oh, thank God. Okay, okay. <laughs> we're going to beat up on advertising agencies. But if advertising agencies spend a lot of time, oh my God, we've got to be creative, we've got to be interesting, and they go back and forth, back and forth. And by the time the customer says, okay, I like the idea, they'll go, well, we've only got three weeks to, or three days to implement. Let's use a, the last time we did the advertising medium, tell it to the customer, and the customer said, yeah, 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 let's go because we're in a hurry. You didn't ask these questions because you're too much of a hurry. So please do that. Challenge your advertising agency. Adding any combination of media is easy. Getting to work is more difficult. The message is going to be consistent. It's going to be like a one-two punch, right? It's like when I hit them on the head with a TV commercial and then hit them on the online. Bang. It's got to it's work. It's going to be fun. It's a one-two punch. Famous. It's a very common expression. And they must complement each other. Okay, because sales are slow, competition is not advertising in the state of the economy, the boss says, I got some money, you're saying, yes, we're going to spend it. And I'm going, no, let's think about it first. What are the objectives? What do you want to do with your money first? That's more important. Metrics is very, very important. Metrics is one way of measuring if your campaign was, in fact, effective. We'll talk about that in a few minutes about marketing ROI. We want awareness. Awareness is important, right? Not definition of marketing. I got some of my students in here. What's the definition of marketing? <laughs> Dan, you gotta remember. Come on. What's the definition of marketing? It's three words. Bring profit to the customer. Sorry. Bring profit. Close. Bring profits. I mean, I saw a few students in my class. <laughs> <laughs> famous definition of marketing, it's easy, it's baby, baby steps easy. Promise delivered. That's branding. Consistent profit. Close. <laughs> Meeting <laughs> needs profitable. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the most simple definition of marketing because the word needs, I could spend an hour on needs. Mm -hmm. I can't do that. But you're actually meeting needs and you're making a profit. Right? So, is awareness going to give you profits? No, it's going to give you a whole bunch of beans and a lot of bananas, and that's no good. So, meeting needs profitably is more important because that's a definition of marketing. <coughs> Look for an agency that gives you that creativity, execution, and integration of all the marketing initiatives. Are we? Do, are we say, is it a bit warm in here? Are we okay? It's a bit warm, huh? Can we? Uh, we go. It's already gone. Can we leave the door open? Maybe leave the door open, maybe? Okay, last one, we're almost done here. As a marketer, you said the first campaign, and you said, okay, well, I'm gonna get involved, we're gonna do the creative, I'll help the team, and you launch this huge campaign, and you're still on top of the world, and you're selling, and you're so happy. And then a the marketer, the leader says, okay, next time, you guys do it. That's another mistake. So if you're a marketing leader, you need to lead the team. That's why you're called a leader, right? You need to engage the team, so don't, don't do the first one and walk away from it. So in this last pitfall, number four, last point, brothers, you know, what was the target? Who, was, who were you targeting? What were the initiatives? What were the goals? Were the leads capturing? You're spending a lot of money to get leads. Are you capturing those leads? Very, very important. And are you monitoring the results? Very, very important. Aha, there's my mother again. At Orange, we would talk about our mothers all the time. Because we're coming out with these really cool products. And we'd say, oh yeah, that's a cool one. Let's kill, let's, let's launch that, what's a killer? Uh, and someone say, well, will my mother understand it? Yeah, but your mother won't understand it, she's silly. No, she isn't, your mother's silly. No, she isn't, and we'd have these debates about who's got the silliest mother. <laughs> well, we did that. Orange, we'd say, will my mother understand this? I mean, a typical example is called, a product called Wildfire, back in the late 90s. You get in your car with your hands free, and you program the phone, right? The say, from 8 to 8.30, I can be reached in the car, or my mobile phone. From 8.30 to 9, Calls are diverted to my secretary. From 9 to 10, I'm in a meeting, goes to my voice messaging system. From 10 to 11, it goes to my colleagues. And then from 11 to 12, I'm taking that on and on. It's a cool system, right? We were like, oh my god, this is like a killer application. So we launched it, and what, what happened? 
Nobody Nothing. Knows about it. it was too complex. We had a few executives who used it, but it was too complex <coughs> to program. Now, if I had thought about explaining this to my mother, she'd go, oh, I don't like that. I don't like programming these things. So, when you're launching a campaign or a message or a new product, if you remember nothing from today, remember your mother. And would your mother understand? And I'm not saying your mothers are silly. I think our mothers are very smart. But you got to show her, you know, will she understand this stuff? If you're launching a new product and it's got 42 different flavors in it, how much is she supposed to remember why it's so, such a big deal? Okay, last one. We'll measure it later. You know, we'll, we'll do the campaign. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. We'll, we'll, we'll measure if we were successful later. Pitfall or landmine number five. John Wanamaker was a famous entrepreneur back in the early 1900s. And he says, half of the money I'm spending on advertising is wasted. I just don't know which half. <laughs> Marketing people who are product managers know this stuff. IRR, internal rate of return, contribution margin, or return on investment. If, you, if you're a marketer and these things scare you, you have to sort of sort of say, I'm going to learn about these things. Because the big bad CFO is going to say, that money you wanted for your advertising campaign is not going to work. So get, and by the way, uh, if you download Leaders of Marketing, www.leadersofmarketing.pro, this is all in here. It's one of the white papers of under resources. So everything I'm talking about now, it's, in a, it's a very, very compact reading material. So let's give you an example, a very simple one. You're going to do a trade show. It's going to cost you a bit of money to do a trade show, and you're trying to justify should you do the trade show or not. Well, the trade show, you're going to find new customers. You're going to find existing customers. There's a few costs involved and the amount of money generated. So you've got some profit margins. You've got tax margins. So essentially, you're going to earn about $8,000 or euros from this event. Your trade show expense was $3,250. So you take $8,000 minus $3,250 divided by the cost. That gives you a return on investment of 146%. It's a very simple example. So in three months from now, when you look back and you say, what was the outcome of that event? If you're hitting 150% or 160, you're saying it was a good deal. If it was 80%, then you didn't do very well because your variables were not very good. So it's one simple way of looking at investments before. What's a sissy? Back in the, we're back in the 70s again. What's a sissy? Not the, not the queen of Austria. <laughs> weak person. A very weak person, thank you. So this is this is you or me. And this is the bully, right? We call him the CFO. Any CFOs in the room? <laughs> oh, we got one in the back there. Okay. So the CFOs like to impress upon us marketing folks and salespeople that we're a lot we're not exactly numbers driven. So you master the ROI and the RR and the NPV. Every time you do campaign, now you're having a debate between you and the C CFO to say, you know what, push him back. I can handle it. Sorry? I need to record that. Can back to the office? Well, don't admit this to your CFO because they know that they intimidate marketing people. But the truth is, the, the, the marketing people need to be more comfortable. So I'm saying if it's, if it's intimidating you, that's okay. Learn it because you need to be more. And once you show to the CFO that you're thinking in terms of ROI, NPV, whatever, he, he or she will be happy because now you're talking the same language. Ron Telecom, the finance people were very, very much involved with our product development people, and it worked well. We knew what finance wanted. We, they gave us a lot of room. And then when we launched things, we already knew what was going to be their main points. So as a summary, not more complicated now than it was back in the 70s, right? Listen to the music. Listen to your salespeople. You may not like his music, you may not like him or her, but you do need to listen and engage feedback with the salesperson. Stick to the shtick, stick to your consistent, stick to what you're good for, stick to what you're renowned for. Branding is a solution to apathy. It will drive your, and you and your employees to do more for your customers. Will my mother understand this? And don't be an ROI system. These are the brands I've worked with. I, I didn't talk much about myself, but I'm, um, 
I'm a telecoms guy first. I've worked in 10 countries, really, really nice places like Thailand, and really, really nasty places like Haiti, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Algeria. And I'm, I'm like the elephant with the little piranha. I'm, 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 I got a few bites off of me, but I'm okay. But I, uh, Romania, okay, one of three things about me. I love Romania. Oh, no. Just no. <laughs> I do. I, I love Romania. I, I have a reference point. I think what we're doing here with education is fascinating. You guys are an educated population in a lot of reading. So one of the key things I, I do is, is I love I love Romania. The second thing is I love business and I love people, but I also love to give back to people. This is part of why I teach with, uh, with, with Dora. Anyway, these are the brands I've worked with. Some of them are fascinating brands. This was a very good school for me. Uh, not in here in Romania, but in, in the Czech Republic and in Thailand. Anyway, some brands I've worked with. And later on, Juana will, be talk, will come and talk to you about our, our Leaders of Marketing event. Fundamentally, if anybody's read Robert Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Rich Man Poor Man, or Rich Dad Poor Dad, he had a fundamental belief in raising the awareness level of financial uh, awareness. And, and I'm, I'm not a Robert Kiyosaki, but I, what I'd like to do is raise the importance of marketing and how people can engage with marketing. And what we've done with this event is really we, we've researched, Juan and I have been working on this at least since November last year. It's going to be a fascinating event. You have it on your, on your seats there. We've got 10 international speakers. These people have 20 to 25 years experience. They love to share knowledge. They, they've done things before. And it really is an investment in you that day. It's, you don't get a diploma. Sometimes you don't always get diplomas in life. But this event, I guarantee you, will be a lot of fun because you're going to learn things. We've got people from Google, two people from Google. We've got people from Microsoft, IBM, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Procter & Gamble. And some of them are entrepreneurs that have worked for some massive organizations like Canadian Tire and Canada. So I am, we're so excited about this, this event. We wanted to share with you and give you a, a really sneak preview later on. I'll let them want to do that. So I have 10 international speakers, but I also wanted two local speakers. And I've got the good fortune and the, the um, the luck of, of having a lady called Bogdana Budna. Bogdana is a fascinating lady. She's, she's full of energy. She was taught abroad. She's worked abroad. She knows everything about Marcoms. And now she's working for Google. And she's a special guest in my marketing classes. Uh, she came uh, last weekend. And not to my surprise, the people said, keep going. We're over two hours. Bogdana, keep talking about social media. See, she knows social media like that. nobody I know. And she's a fascinating lady because she's got that core which we're looking for. It's people that, that thought of pizza. Forget the pizza. Mark that at the door, right? Knowledgeable, but you know what? I'm not smarter than you. I'm here because I want to, I want to share things with you. But she's also got this wonderful personality. That's one of our speakers. The second one is here tonight. His name is Drago Shorov. Now, I am considered the, probably the best networker in the world. Like the beer. At least I thought it was. I'm a minnow. I'm a lightweight when it comes to networking. This man does networking. And you know what's fascinating? For the second thing, uh, second thing, Gorina, I love to help my fellow Romanians to network because we're going, no, I don't want to network. Why would I network? Why would I help someone? It's funny for me to see this because I did in my own career the things I've done through people. I always talk about people, I talk about planning and marketing first, but you'll hear me speak often about people. And when it comes to networking, this man is an expert in networking. He's got a wonderful way of, of promoting that. And network, networking is very important. Anyway, Dragos is a phenomenal person, and he hates when I do this, but it's, it's sincere. It's, it's not bullshit. I, I, okay, almost 45 minutes. Okay, no, it isn't. It's 42. I've got three more minutes of really putting it on Dragos. Uh, I have an expression, not VIP, but a VIR, a very important Romanian. Uh, I use that, and when I meet some, I'm like, whoa. Adrian Stanchu, one of our professors, is a VIR. He is a role model. He's been in business. He's before the revolution. He, he, he managed a large business after. He's, he's an icon. Dragos is an authority on online. He self-published, he had his own company for 10 years, he sold it right before the recession, did well. 
And then uh, also he's considered a digital nomad. That's his favorite title. He's a guy that knows everybody in online in Romania, and thanks to him, Andrei Roshka, is, where's Andrei? Andrei is, is one of the foremost bloggers and organization, and through Dragos, through networking, I said, Dragos, who do you know? I said, I know Andrei, and he introduced me to Andrei, and as a result, Andrei is, is working with us. So, the guy is amazing because he's done, he's done things, he's modest, he's bright, he's also uh, managed, he had an iPhone application based out of New Zealand, so to me, he's an icon for Romanians looking to, hey, we're going to stay in Romania because there's opportunities here, and I really believe that, which is the third thing I want to share with you, is that we're, something special about me is I'm convinced there's a lot of opportunities here in Romania. But you, and, I'm, and I'm motivated even more when I, when I work and I, and I meet people like Dragos. When I said to Dragos, I need to meet Redu Jajescu, done. I said, I need to meet Orlando Nicuara, done. I said, I need to meet this person, done. And, and as a result, I'm a better person for it. So we're, uh, Juan and I are extremely proud and happy to have uh, Dragos as part of our Leaders in Marketing event. And I'm, and I'm happy, uh, and so is Dorina, to have the pleasure of having um, uh, Dragos come and speak to us today. So without any further delay, Roxana, if you could sort of reconnect us here for Dragos. Uh, and